Have you ever watched someone get away with a sin uh, or a crime? Have you ever seen someone doing something bad? Maybe it was snagging a cookie when they weren't supposed to, or maybe it was stealing something right in front of your eyes. And you saw that it was happening and it was happening unfairly, right? They, they were doing something bad. Maybe they were even treating someone unfairly. They were being mean to someone who didn't deserve it, uh, who had done nothing to them in any sort of way. How did that make you feel? How, did you want to get revenge when you saw that happening? Did you care about justice for that victim? See, James is writing, as we pick up in James chapter 5, he's writing again to a group of Christians, a group of believers, that, that were treated unfairly by others. These people have seen lots of bad stuff happen to themselves and to, to others that they care about. They were discriminated and persecuted against because they were followers of Christ, because they were living a life that was different than the others around them. They were the ones being treated unfairly. And yet today we'll see what James has to share with them. As we open today's passage, we'll actually see a, a change in, in tone that James has. His tone changes, and it goes from, from do this to do this to, to becoming very pastoral in sense, to becoming a, a great friend of these people and reminding them, calling them brothers or brethren in some translations, right? As he's saying, we're in this together. I'm not coming to you as an authority, but I'm coming to you as a brother along your side to share with you something incredibly important. My hope is that today, as we read this passage, that you would begin to grow in just that, that you would see this passage, and from myself even, as a pastor, but also as, as a brother of yours, to share with you what James has for us today. The things that are going to begin to change in our lives because we follow what James has to say in our passage. This passage starts off to be a part where, where James begins to summarize what he's talked about in the rest of this letter. And as it comes to the end of the letter, he begins to bring this to them. And so I want to encourage you to do this. Maybe if you have your paper Bible, you know, get your paper Bible out. You may need to hit pause for a second. And we're going to read James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Just four verses today, but I think our four incredible verses that can be so powerful in our lives if we just listen and obey them. And so we're going to pause right now, go ahead and read these verses, and then I'll pray for us. God, we thank you again for your scripture. God, we thank you again for the words of James. Uh, God, I pray that today as we read them, as we begin to look at them, God, that it would be a reminder to us of who you are, God, it would be a reminder to us of, of how you've called us to live in our life. And God, because of what we read today, that maybe we would look at life a little bit differently. God, that we would have your perspective and not the world's perspective. God, would you do that in our hearts today as we see and read your word together? In your son's name, amen. Amen. So again, as we jump into it, I want to encourage you, uh, maybe take some notes, get your Bible out. We're in, again, James chapter 5. Uh, verse 7. And the first thing that we see in this passage is this. We see an appeal to be patient, right? James kind of summarizes everything in this very first appeal that he has to them. And it's, it calls us to be patient, right? Our human nature is not one of patience. We don't like to wait for, for pretty much anything, right? If we were to be honest, none of us want to be patient about anything, uh, I read this quote this week uh, from this author. It says, this is that I'm extremely patient, right? Provided I get my own way in the end, right? Because that's what it comes down to. We want our own way and our inability to be patient causes us, right? Because we want our own way. We want things to happen our way. And so we're not patient for it to come along towards us, right? And so in today's world and our fast-paced society, right, and our self-centered culture. We've talked a lot about that through James as we've looked at selfishness, and he has, he's addressed that. You know, in our culture, it would tell us that, that we don't need to wait for anything and that we should go after the things that we want, right? And that by having the things that we want and going after them, that we don't need to be a patient person. It's even beginning to 
go away amongst Christians. We see that patience is not really actually optional for the Christian. It's a huge part of following Jesus. It's a trait that we see in our lives. Apostle Paul talked about it all the time. He commanded Christians to demonstrate patience with each other. In fact, it's, I think, an incredible part of Christian authenticity, right? Not how you know someone's a believer, but right, a, a true believer is someone that would have patience in their lives. The true part of Christian character is someone who has this evidence of patience in our lives. And so James writes this. We'll read verse 7 together. In verse 7, he says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Right in this very first part, we see that he's telling us to be patient. These words and these appeals are are made, again, to people that that understand what it's like to be persecuted. Understand what it's like to not get their way. You and I know right now, right, what it's like to not get our way. In our culture today, we might be living differently or we might be doing things differently if we had everything our way. These people, so much more than we're suffering today, right, are understanding what that means. And so they need to be reminded, and we need to be reminded to be patient people, right? To put on this this selflessness, to become patient uh, in, in every single way. And he reminds them to not just be patient to, for patience' sake, but to be patient knowing that it's not our job, right? It's not your job and it's not my job to be the judge and jury for the world. It's actually God's job and, and he will, as we see the, the second part of this verse 7 here. It says, be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See, he's reminding them that the coming of the Lord is imminent, that, that God has promised, that Jesus has promised that he will, will come back, that he will come back for his people. He reminds them to be patient and not worry about the ones who who are oppressing them because ultimately the coming of the Lord will bring about justice. Maybe as I mentioned earlier, when you saw someone being treated unfairly or you saw someone taking something that didn't belong to them, maybe you were distraught about that. Maybe you, you suffered because of it and you thought, man, that's not right. That's not good. I might need to do something about that. Maybe you stepped up and you said something about it or maybe... You just waited patiently and knowing that the Lord will come. The Lord will ultimately be the one to judge all. And this this patience reminds us of even at the very beginning of the book of James. James chapter 1 verse 4 says, And let the steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Right? This word steadfastness, right? It really is, in many ways, patience. See, the key here is he's reminding us is, is to be patient. We see this word patience come up like uh, about six times in these couple of verses, right? Six different times in the passage it's, it's mentioned. Uh, and it's mentioned again throughout the book of James. And so not only for, for them, but for us today to know that patience is actually a theme of the New Testament in so many ways. We see patience in, in Galatians as one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? We see Paul talk about it to the Colossians um, in verse, chapter 3, verse 12. He says to them, he says, Put on then God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He's talking to, to God's people that are holy and beloved. Compassionate hearts, he tells them. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These are all marks of a believer. These are all marks of followers of Jesus Christ. And so today, I ask you, is it a mark of your life? Is patience a mark as you go about your daily life? See, we we might need to ask ourselves, why is it that he needs to tell them to be patient? Why do we need to be reminded to be patient? I think it boils down to this. That the Bible's understanding of patience and is it being, a like I said, a true Christian virtue. It's it's rooted uh, in, in God's word. Patience begins with something important that our world just doesn't get. And it's that God is sovereign over everything. 
that you and me as believers in Jesus can understand and could submit to God's sovereignty, his control over everything. See, our world would say that, that only man's in control and you're in control of your own destiny. But as a Christian, we know ultimately God is the one in control. He's in control of all of human history. And he's working in our lives as humans. He's working in other humans' lives. And so for us, being patient is about submitting to God's sovereignty. Submitting to him and knowing that, that he's the one in control. Do you believe that? As a Christian, do you believe that or do you, do you know that? I'd say there's a difference between believing and knowing, right? You might say, yeah, I know God's in control, but does your life look like it? Does your life look like someone's who knows that God's in control? Are you patient to let God intervene? Are you patient to let God make those moves? Do you understand and see that in the scheme of our life, eternity is just on the horizon? And it takes a new significance in our life to realize that the things that we're going through or the, the things that we may be suffering really are not a big deal in the grand scheme of eternity. And I think that's part of what James is reminding the Christians here in this book. Is in the end of this chapter, he's reminding them in a real pastoral way. And I want to do the same with you. I want to remind you that in the midst of the struggles and trials of, of our daily lives, whatever might be in front of you, whatever might be happening around you, whatever may be happening to you or against you, in the end, God is sovereign. And as Christians, we submit to his control. Right? We live in him and we find our, our fulfillment in him and not in anything of this world. And so when we feel persecuted against, when we feel that we've been wronged, we need to have patience knowing that in the grand scheme of things, God is the one in control. He's ultimately the one who's at work. And we may not understand what work he might be doing in someone else's life, how he may be using even that moment of disobedience or, or sin in their life to convict them and draw them to himself. And so our patience relies on the fact that we know that God is sovereign. Patience, patience for the Christian is understanding that we know that God is at work and that he's at work in people's lives to restore them. He's at work in people's lives to bring glory to himself and that ultimately he is the one who's going to call them to justice, no matter what that looks like. And so we see in this passage what James begins to do. He, he gives them some examples, right? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I need an example. I'm told to be patient. I can be told to be patient a bunch of times. But for me to sometimes get something and understand it, I need an example. And so James does just that in a very, again, pastoral way. And he brings up a farmer. And he says that the bottom, uh, the back half of, of verse uh, 7. So he talks about the experience of a farmer. I don't know if any of you are farmers. I don't know if you've ever grown anything. Anything I've ever tried to grow has ended up dying usually, uh, usually out of my own neglect, sometimes out of just the fact it wasn't a good space or time or place to do it. But the reality is uh, they would have understood this, this verbiage, right? They didn't go to a farmer's, they didn't have markets and that sort of thing and at this time. Again, you would have known where your food came from. You would have understood and grasped the idea of what a farmer had to go through to get that food uh, to your table or for you to get it from them. And so we see this in the verse that he says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. See, we see this example of a farmer. Right? If they go out and they, they start to produce their crops before the rains have come, before things are, are fully developed, right? they're not going to yield the same amount of fruit. They're not going to get the same gains out of it. Right? If they begin to go and harvest while things are small and not yet nourished to the point where they need to be, right? that's what he's calling and saying to them in many ways. It's not going to come to the fulfillment. Right? They're going to miss out on, on the great things to come. Right, that their field 
could, could harvest more in that process if they were be patient. And so he reminds them, he says, be patient like the farmer has to be patient. They see things start to grow. My son is growing tomatoes right now in our backyard. Right? He started this process almost two months ago, maybe three months ago. And these little tomato plants for three months have been uh, needing to get watered daily and taken care of and, and put up props to help them grow in right directions and to not fall down and collapse upon the weight of the fruit beginning to produce in it. Do you know how many tomatoes he's harvested so far out of these three plants after, I think, about three months? I think he's gotten two very small tomatoes, one of them minuscule. But as he counts the plants and he sees how many tomatoes might be on it, he knows that he can't pluck those now because he knows and recognizes that, that he'll have 50, 60, 70, 80 tomatoes here uh, once it comes to fruition. And so there's patience that's involved. James uses this example because they would have grasped it. I think for us to recognize and realize that we also need to be patient people, that we can be patient like the farmer is. He also says again there, for us to establish our hearts, right? And waiting for the day of the Lord to come. He says, you also be patient in verse 8. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So for us to be patient, to wait and wait upon the day of the Lord, to know that it's coming, to know that it'll be here, to know the day of the great harvest will come, to know that God has promised that, that Jesus would come back. And in that moment, he'll take his people to be with him. We can allow the things that we get upset about right now to go away. In those moments when we get to face Christ, when we get to see God face to face, right? the worries of this world will go away. They will seem like nothing. He also reminds them in their relationships, right? Not to, to grumble against one another. We see this in verse 9. He continues on and he says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Right? We're to treat each other with love. We're to treat each other brother, Christian, sister, Christian, as one who follows him. We're supposed to treat each other with respect and patience. Not to be upset with one another, but to care for them in these same ways. So he gives us the example of the farmer. The other example he gives us is, a, is of the prophets. We see this in, in verse 10. And he gives us an example of the prophets and, and he says to be patient like the prophets. And if I were to tell you to be patient like the prophets, uh, what would you first think of? Would you even be able to name some of the prophets? Uh, now again, at this time, they would have known the prophets' names right off the top of their heads. To say, be patient like the prophets, uh, maybe may have been even bigger than to be patient like a farmer. Right? But he uses these examples so that they all make sense to him. The prophets Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, they, they, they all went through uh, different afflictions and sufferings and were patient. See, this, this example that we see that they went through is they would, the prophets would come and they would bring the word of the Lord to the people, to the Israelites in many cases, right? They would come and they would speak for God. In the Old Testament, they would speak for God and they would remind them and instruct them and they would communicate God's word to ancient Israel, right? The prophets were, were not always happy, right? Their, their demeanor wasn't always great. Uh, they had to go through a number of trials. They had to go through a number of, of hard things along the way. But the prophets were patient, with God's people. They continued to preach God's word. There were moments where it wasn't easy. There were moments where it was difficult. There were moments where it was hard. But they understood in their life because they loved God and they wanted to do his will that they would follow him no matter what. And that came about in their lives as being patient, enduring the suffering that was before them and sharing God's message as they did the entire way. Ultimately, they were steadfast and they listened to God. Again, in verse 10, he says this. He says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke for the name of the Lord. Right? As another example, remember what people before you have done. Right? And sometimes for us, it's good to remember that there have been other Christians before us. There have been other believers before us. Right? 
and, and nobody's perfect, but in the same sense, we can look back and we can say, you know what, I can be encouraged to live a, a patient life because I've seen someone else live that life. I know that my parents or grandparents, I know that, that my friend or my cousin or, or my pastor or my, my life group leader, I, I've seen them live out life and they've, they've been through what I've been through. And they're patient and they're reliant upon the Lord. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. And so maybe in your life it's not to look at the, the prophets of Israel, but maybe it's to look at those who have gone before you. To see what they've gone through and to treat others. Look at their steadfastness and say, you know what? They've done it, I can do it. I can live a patient life. Or maybe it is to learn from their mistakes in ways that they hadn't. We see that here maybe just a little bit as he, he addresses it in verse 11. Uh, the experience of Job. He brings up Job. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job before, but if, if you're ever feeling bad about yourself, read the book of Job and know that somebody else has had it worse than you. And he brings him up here in verse 11. Uh, he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I mean, when you, you read the book of Job, um, it doesn't seem like always compassion and mercy. It, it seems like he's gone through a lot. He's gone through a lot of suffering. He goes through, literally the word long suffering, I think, comes from the book of Job. Uh, when you look up that word, it means patience in spite of troubles that are coming against you, no matter who they're coming from. Oftentimes not coming from yourself. You know, long-suffering and patience. These are all synonyms and words used in so many ways to describe what it means to be a believer in Jesus. So many ways to describe the Christian character of someone who's following him. Again, as we look at this fruit of the Spirit of patience, as we were reminded here by, jo uh, by James to, to become and be a patient person. Again, I want to draw you just to the end of that verse. And it says this in the end of verse 11. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord. And the Lord is compassionate and merciful. If there's any reason for us to remember to be patient, it's to remember that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. We, we've submitted our lives to him as a Christian. You, you begin to follow him as a Christian. It's because you know that he's been compassionate and merciful in your life. He's forgiven you your sins. He's, he's given you new life in Jesus. Right? He's been compassionate and merciful to you. And so our job is to, to live for him in so many ways. Our job is to then become a patient person as we follow after Jesus. That's what it begins to look like in our life. And I urge you, I think as we, we finish this, this week's lesson, right? my hope is that we would be driven back to our love for God and recognize that he's been compassionate and merciful to us. He sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. He sent Jesus to, to love you while, while we didn't love him. Right? He, he's died for, for sinners, for all sinners, for you and for me. And it should drive us to love him. And, and as we love God, it's going to be an outflow of our life that would become patient people. Again, that doesn't mean we become perfect people, but it means that we practice patience. We grow in what it means to be patient. And like you and me and, and the Christians that James is writing to, I, I pray that this letter would be a reminder to us, one of God's great patience for us as mankind, and that he provided a way for you to have a relationship with him despite our sin. And in the same way that we would have patience waiting for his return, that we would be patient people and that, that others would see us as patient people as we live for Jesus, that would be a mark of your life. Let me pray that that would be a mark for us today. God, again, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in our life. God, we thank you for, for who you are. God, I pray that you would help us, God, to live this out. Would you give us reminders? Maybe even this week. Maybe we would drive by a farm. <laughs> Maybe we would see fruit growing in a field and recognize and realize that, that it's being produced, right? That it's awaiting the moment that's right.
God, would we live in eager anticipation of your return, waiting for the moment that it's right, that you return, God? Can we live patiently for that? And God, as we do that, would you help us in our world today with the the sufferings that might come our way? God, with the things that are in front of us, would you give us patience? Would you help us to not be impatient people? Would you help us to not be selfish, but instead be selfless and patient with others, God? We love you and we thank you in your son's name. Amen. Amen, guys. Thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in person real soon. Take care.